Hello, this is Paul, the Oka Knight, back with you once again to play through one of my favorite games, Normandy 44, designed by Mark Simonich and published by GMT Games. About a year and a half ago, I started this channel as an experiment, and at that time I had Normandy 44 sibling, Holland 44, on the table, so I began by creating a series showing how that game uh, would be played. To this day, it remains one of the most popular of everything I have done. I am still getting mail with nice comments from you guys. So, as a gift to you all, let's play Normandy 44's seven day short campaign. It contains a full invasion, covers the Allied effort to form stable beachheads and link them together. It plays identical to the full 21 day campaign, it just stops two weeks earlier. To begin, let's take a brief look at the map. Let's start by taking a look at the uh, Cherbourg Peninsula. And up at the very end, of course, we have the Port of Cherbourg. Now, in the uh, full campaign, that's a very important place. I'm not sure you can win this as the Allies unless you capture it. Historically, they took it right about uh, uh, where, this, where this game ends. And so one of the big goals in the full campaign is to take Cherbourg. Now, Cherbourg has a defense perimeter. That's this black dotted line. The units behind that dotted line cannot move until released when allies get within a couple hexes of it. So for the seven-day campaign, you know, this stuff is pretty much eye candy. It's, uh, we're not going to get that far in the seven days that we have to deal with, each turn being one day. As we go to further uh, away from Cherbourg, we see the peninsula as uh, in its entirety. It is dominated by Bocage. That's this kind of green terrain here. And then as we get over to Utah Beach and uh, we see the paradroppers getting ready to drop, we have, we have a bunch of rivers and flooded hexes and flooded hex sides. Basically a bunch of real junk that we have to get through. Lots of fortifications along the coast. Here is the uh, uh, first guys on the beach at Utah, these are the reserve troops that will come in shortly thereafter. The jumpers are at their drop zones, and you can see on the map, that would be a drop zone right there. In this game, uh, paratroops don't drift, but they can be disrupted, and they can take hits. So one of the first things we're going to do... Uh, once we get to the invasion, is to check their status as far as what happened to them in the drop. Continuing up the coast, we have Omaha Beach. Well, first, I guess we'd have, we have uh, Point du Hoc, and we have the, the Rangers getting ready to come in. Uh, one of them will hit it. The other is 50-50, whether it will actually hit it or transfer over to Omaha. Historically, they did exactly that. Uh, they transferred over. Here we have two, two uh, hexes for containing beachheads for Omaha with our reserve troops. Now, in this game, invasions don't fail per se. The only place where an invasion can actually out and out fail is at Omaha. And you only do that by rolling successive ones. If you roll a one, the, at the attacking stack takes a hit, and then you roll again. And if you roll a one again, it takes a hit, and you keep on going, and if you lose all combat power, then that part of Omaha Beach doesn't make it. In a real game, I would suggest house ruling that so that yes, you, ro you roll a one, you take a hit, and then beyond that, you ignore any further ones and just keep rolling until you roll something else. I don't think anybody want, would really want to play a game where the allies were hobbled right from the very first turn of the game. That wouldn't be fun. Going farther up the coast, we see the Brits and the Canadians, Gold, Juno, Sword, same kind of deal. We have the, the troops that are going to be landing on the individual beaches at the front, and I place the reserve troops back there. Meanwhile, of course, we got gobs of troops back in England. Uh, up here on the map, we have uh, aircraft, which will not be, uh, they don't take part in turn one, but the ships do, okay? And we'll get into that as we get into the invasion. We have a weather, weather track, and we are always at uh, uh, Overcast 2 at the start of the game. Up here we have a chart that we roll on for weather effects. Now, in this game, there's an optional rule where, where you basically use historical weather, or at least 
less variant weather, I strongly suggest you use that, especially in the seven turn game, because if you roll storms in, the, in this game with only seven turns, not much is gonna happen. So the way this works, is uh, first turn is automatically overcast, second turn is 50-50, overcast two or overcast three, overcast three being less severe. After that, you're gonna roll on the weather chart and ignore any one that you roll, okay? So instead of, instead of having a storm, we'll either have uh, one, or, one or the other overcast levels or clear, and not all the clear is created the same. Each one has a little different effect on, on uh, reinforcement rates and so forth. As far as the actual terrain goes, again, back over here by the peninsula, we have a whole bunch of bocage and junk terrain as we get over to the map edge. It remains that way pretty much. As we go pan east, it's still pretty much bocage. But then we get into more clear terrain around Caen, or as we say in East Tennessee, Caen. <laughs> Around Cayenne, it gets clear, okay? This is a mixed terrain, this is not bocage. You can see the difference between these two hexes. That's mixed, that's bocage. So this is less severe than bocage, and then it clears up entirely, getting, going all the way to the map edge, to Falaise, okay? The colors along the map edge, those are entry areas for the German troops. They're color-coded by where they come in. Uh, and then going all the way over to where the British jumpers come in, uh, this would, I assume that would be Pegasus Bridge on that hex side right there. Uh, and, uh, well, they're going to roll. They have the same kind of random rolls that the Americans have, except theirs are less severe. Uh, they used a lot of gliders, and, well, they just didn't take the losses that, uh, that the, uh, that the uh, Americans did when they landed. Okay. So, uh, now, f for the short campaign, for the short campaign, the victory conditions are... The allies get points for accomplishing certain things, with negative points being applied if they actually have a beachhead fold. Barring that, it's all going to be positive points. And those points are having all five beachheads, okay? Second is having the road from Juneau Beach clear of enemy zones of control all the way to St. Mariglis. And this is going to be the hardest nut to crack. The, car uh, the area around Carrington. Lots of rivers, flooded hexes, and it's got a nice juicy road going all the way back to entry area for German reinforcements. So the Germans can get there relatively quickly. Um, and then see the town of Bayou is a, is a victory hex. That's the main, uh, it's actually a city. And it's right in the middle between the US and the Commonwealth uh, beachhead, so it's an important place. Beyond that, you get more. Po you get points for uh, the Allies capturing uh, cities that are or towns that are beyond the uh, limits of naval bombardment. Which we see this blue line. That's the limit of naval bombardment. It has a perimeter all around, and of course, that is how far the ships can shoot inland. But if we capture uh, towns beyond that then that will also uh, provide victory points for, uh, for winning. So that is the seven day campaign, the seven turn campaign. Those of you who have followed my channel know that I do not attempt to read the rule book to you guys. Instead, I simply dive in and explain things as we go. So with that, the jumpers are over their drop sites, the troops are heading towards the Higgins boats, the invasion has begun. So let's dive right in, and without uh, talking about too many rules, let's just start to play and see how the game unfolds. Before we really start, though, I want to mention the sequence of play. I mean, basically, the, the game is a U-turn, me-turn sort of game. The Germans have the first player turn of each turn, the Allies second. But in the first turn, there's a special invasion phase that happens before any of that. So it's going to be invasion phase, German phase, Allied phase. So in a sense, the, uh, the Allies are going to get two moves on turn one and turn one only. And the invasion phase is composed of basically the airdrops and the actual uh, landings on the beaches. Okay? Both of these are handled in quick and easy fashion. Uh, they have their own results table that's only used for, 
for the uh, airdrops and only used for the beach invasion. So let's take a quick look at that. If you see in the middle of the screen, you see the airborne scatter table. And basically all this is, is for every, for every paratrooper that's landing, you roll based on their unit, 82nd, 101st, or British 6th. Uh, and you can see there's a plus one for glider units, so they have a little easier time of it. The number, uh, when you see like an S2, the two is the number of steps the unit loses, and S means it's scattered, which limits its capabilities until the end of the turn when it rallies. It's possible to have no effect whatsoever. It's possible to take two step hits, and the, uh, the jumpers are generally three step units. So you go down to a cadre. First step, you flip the counter. Second, or first hit, you, hit the, you flip the counter. Second hit, you substitute a cadre for the unit that's taking the hits. So it's, it's, not, it's not very good when it's down to cadre. No offensive capability, and uh, you know, one step from, from getting taken up off the board. All right, so we're going to have to roll for each and every one of the jumpers that's hitting the table. Here's the invasion. Uh, here's the invasion table. It's kind of a CRT, but it's special. If you look real close, you'll see every single one of these. Uh, for every beach, it has an advance. Basically, the the allies can't lose on the invasion. Okay, when they hit the beaches, the one exception is in the upper left-hand corner. You see the A1 star result for Omaha Beach. That is the, the invasion zone. There's two of them in, the, in Omaha Beach. Dak loses one step and has to try again. And they keep doing that either until they run out of offensive power or they stop rolling once. Okay? So it is possible. There are two two step, excuse me, there are two three step uh, infantry units and a two step uh, tank unit that's hitting the beach. So if you roll a whole bunch of ones, yes, it is possible for an invasion zone in Omaha Beach to fail. If it runs out, if it has no offensive attack factor anymore, uh, they, have to, they have to go back home to England. Uh, I've never seen that happen. But if you get into one of these deals where you, whatever, whatever die you touch rolls a one, yes, it could happen. If for competitive play, uh, it's like if you've scheduled time with a buddy, it's a Saturday afternoon, and, you know, how often do you actually get together, and something like that happens, I would suggest a house rule it so that no invasion zone can roll more than two ones. So they'll take two hits, and then the next one you just roll something other than a one. You're going to take more damage. You'll be all beat up. But at least you have a game to play, because in the unlikely event the Omaha Beach folds, it wouldn't be much of a, gain in my, a game in my estimation. The German can high-five himself about his, about his brilliant play, and uh, I, I would just to say house rule that one away. And finally, you see this uh, DD table. Every tank that hits the beach at the end has to roll on the, on the Donald Duck table uh, with a 50-50 chance of taking a loss. So let's go ahead and give this a go. Now, I think later on, as we get into this, I'll start doing a little bit more summary work. But for right now, I'm going to show you. So let's go in. Here are our jumpers that we have hitting uh, the, for the American side. So I'm just going to start rolling and we will start applying results. All right. So starting with the guy on the left, I rolled a two, which is bad. A2, D, or, or excuse me, that was the invasion table, S2. All right, so what does that mean? That means he takes two step losses. So that's one and then two. And he's taken off the board, and he is disrupted. Now, uh, in, in, in this game, there are no replacements for paratroopers. There are no replacement factors. I say that in a qualified way. What happens is when you, have a, when you take losses because of the initial scatter, you can bank those replacements. So here is the, uh, oops, try this side. Here's the replacement marker for, for, the, uh, for the Allies, for the Amer Americans. They took two, uh, two losses on the drop, so it is, they banked two points. So if nothing else happens to that unit, they'll get them back. It's just going to take time. Uh, but these are the only replacements they're going to get for the, for the jumpers for the entire game. All right, next. Uh, 
let's see. Okay, the guy on the lower left. We're going to go with, uh, oops, this guy. Let me get that back. All right. Six. Well, you know, that's the only result. He that has him land completely and totally intact. This is the 82nd we're dealing with. They have the nasty table. All right, next guy over. And yes, next guy, next guy over. Let's see what he does. Four. And he does an S1. So he's going to be disrupted since he's only taking one hit. Since he's only taking one hit, he flips. He does not go to cadre. All righty. I'm going to roll the next three and apply the results. And we'll see what we got. And here we are. And we can see that the first uh, 101st didn't take any losses and was not even dis uh, was not even scattered. Uh, the next guy took one loss and the next guy took, excuse me, the next guy took no losses and the next guy took one loss, both of, both of which, of course, become scattered as well. So this is, I would consider this to be above average uh, result for the American drop. Uh, we had two units completely unaffected. One unit kind of blasted. The others are in pretty good shape. Now we go on to the British. There are three British jumpers that we need to take care of to the east of Caen, and uh, I'm going to resolve those. We'll see how we go. Now, the British have the easiest table, so hopefully, I mean, if, things, if the odds go the way they should, these guys should not be that badly damaged. And, of course, the British pay for the Americans' good luck. Uh, even though the unit to the south was unaffected, the other two took uh, one loss each and were scattered. And so the British are going to have two replacements added to their tally for the jumpers. Uh, and they have their own tally, so the, the American replacements are separate from the British. And uh, finally, you can see that I, I, I mistakenly put a disrupted counter on these guys. They Scattered is a set different status than disrupted. So, uh, so I've corrected that by putting the appropriate counters down on the Americans. All right, that's it. We're now done with the airdrops. Let's move on to the, to the landings. Over to Utah Beach, uh, we see that there's only one landing zone there. We're going to roll on the invasion table under the Utah Beach column, and let's see what we get. A six. That's good for the Americans. That is uh, uh, one loss and advance two. That is a D1 advance two, so the defender takes a hit. These are one-step units. So this guy's gone, and we get to advance two. Now... We were considered to have been on top of him during the beach landing, so the advance is from this point. So what we have is that the uh, we had an advance too from this point. Uh, this is a mixed hex; it's no problem. One of the, one guy just like this moved in here with his tank, and this guy moved into the flooded hex, which stops his advance, but it's already his second hex of advance, so it doesn't do much uh, as far as how far he moves. Uh, being in there, he will have to uh, he will have to be halved attacking out of there, and the tank did not have the option of going into the flooded hex. So the idea is we one of the one of the tough objectives is to link up Omaha and Utah, and that part of that tough part is right here. This is probably the, t uh, the biggest obstacle that we have to face. And so I want to put immediate pressure over there and see what we can do. All right, we're over to, uh, we're over to Omaha Beach. So we're attacking with the left hand uh, uh, stack first. And uh, I rolled a two, which is bad, but at least it doesn't force us to uh, roll again. So the, the landing is successful. The attacking force takes two hits. The defending force takes one hit. Uh, and it is allowed to advance one. With the A2D1 result, uh, the two uh, infantry regiments that are underneath the tank that you see each take one hit. They flip over to the reverse side, and the coastal defense unit is eliminated. Now, I did, I did a quick look up the advance. Uh, uh, advance one means they get to be on the beach. They don't, uh, so it does not mean they advance further inland, which means that I corrected my advance over here at Utah. 
So they had each unit, the first, they had an A2 result. The first one was on the beach. The second one, they got to go one hex inland each. Note that these coastal defense markers have, a, have kind of a white ring around the perimeter of the counter. That means they do not have a zone of control. Uh, let's do the next hex of Omaha. And the big red one rolls a five, which is a good result, A1D1. They destroy the coastal defense, take one hit on one of the, on one of the uh, 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 first infantry division units, and they get the advanced one means that they're on the beach. Note that uh, with the with the Omaha rule and all the rules as far as taking losses on invasion, you cannot take the losses with the armored units. They will have to make their rolls later when we roll for the Donald Duck rolls. So there are four steps of uh, of. Well, there's six steps here, but two of them would be cadres. You would have four chances of not rolling a one uh, to be able to successfully land in each one of these beaches. Again, my suggestion is that you limit it to two and then let the guy on with uh, saving some kind of uh, uh, combat power. All right, let's go on to the, uh, to the United Kingdom and the, and the uh, Canadians. Starting on the left, we rolled a, a three, which is A1, D1, advance one. So one of the Brits takes a hit. And, uh, and uh, they successfully get their, their lodgement onto the beach. The next guy. Six. Great roll. Uh, remember that uh, the, the, the Brits and the, the Commonwealth are rolling on yet a different table, which I, I think it's in between. Utah, I think, is the easiest time, and Omaha is the hardest time. Uh, we roll a six. So let's see. D1 destroys the... Def Destroy the defender, advance to no losses. Um, so let's take a look at what we want to do. So the first hex of advance gets us onto the beach. We do have another one, which I do believe we will take advantage of. Note that the, the unit from the 716th uh, on the German side does have a zone of control. There's no ring around it. Like you see over to the right, the unit with a white ring around it. This one does not have that. But in this game, zones of control are soft. Uh, which means you, they, they, they can be, to a limited extent, moved th uh, through, and he does get to advance through this. The game also has what's called a Zach Bond, which is a, a, a stronger, almost impenetrable uh, type of zone of control. And we'll explain that later as we get into standard combat. So for right now, all you need to know is that we do get to advance into another hex and to get off this damn beach and make room for the follow-ons that are going to come uh, the second wave will come in the Allied regular turn after the Germans have a chance to move. And we want to have some empty room on the beach for them to land. So let's go ahead and uh, move off this beach. And we have advanced off the beach. Uh, now, unlike, uh, unlike uh, Utah Beach, where I'm not worried about anything sneaking up on me and, and walking onto the beach if I take everything off, here it's not so simple, and we do want to leave somebody behind just in case. After all, we're right next to a German unit. We don't want him to walk onto the beach. Which brings us to the Canadians on Juno Beach. So let's take a shot at that, starting with the guy on the left. We roll a three, not too shabby. A1, D1, advance one. All right, so we've seen this before. Uh, and the second uh, uh, stack on Nan uh, Beach went ahead and rolled this exact same result, A1, D1, advance one. So both these stacks took one hit each off of an infantry unit. They cannot take it off the tank uh, and successfully got onto the beach. And over at Sword Beach, there's only one beach here, and I rolled a one, which is bad. So there's going to be two hits applied. They do get on. It's advanced one, and the defending unit is eliminated. And the last thing we need to do in the invasion sequence is to roll uh, one die on the Donald Duck table for each and every armor unit that came in uh, in the first wave of the invasion. Uh, each roll is a 50-50 chance of delivering a hit to that unit. So you can see here we had four out of five of the British slash Commonwealth units take a hit. And on the American side, we had one out of the three take a hit. So a little below average, but yeah, it's livable. Normally, the first phase of the game is something called the initial phase, and it's going to do things like uh, uh, you do the weather rolls, determine the weather for the turn, uh, replacements, reinforcements, 
all that sort of stuff can happen during this, uh, during this initial phase. On the first turn of the game, there is no initial phase because there are no, there's only the prescribed units entering uh, for the American side. There's no, uh, there's no German reinforcements entering. So it kind of is what it is as far as uh, weather goes. It is determined by rule to be overcast two, which is the second worst weather. Uh, there is a difference between overcast two and overcast three. And likewise, if you look up here, and these are die rolls, right? There's a difference between clear four, clear five, and clear six. Each has its own profile for replacements and the number of air units that are active, things of that nature, okay? Now, personal opinion, and actually it's an optional rule covering this, and I do like the optional rule, especially in the short campaign, I highly recommend using it, is basically historical weather, okay? Historical weather by rule is overcast two. You, ne you never roll for weather on the first turn, even without the rule. But after that, it would be a die roll, and I don't like that. Uh, as far as getting storms. Storms are really tough on the Allies. If you only have seven turns, two, two storm rolls, then you might as well not play the game, okay? Uh, turn two, it's 50-50, whether it's gonna be overcast two or overcast three. After that, you are rolling on the weather table, okay? Uh, the optional rule is that you ignore a one. You simply re-roll a one, there will be no storms. There will be no storms, except where you see above, Turns 14, 15, and 16 are automatically storms. That's it. That's the only storms you're going to get in the game with the optional rule. I like this rule. Reason why I like this rule. We, we go through all kind of pains to have a realistic experience with our war game. Okay? We got a 20-some page rule book that we're trying to adhere to, to have the, the mechanically and logically the things turn out within, within reasonable parameters. And we go through all this effort to have reasonable things happen in the game uh, at a pretty sophisticated level. And then we leave the weather up to a die roll, okay? Uh, a, a string of bad weather, weather rolls can ruin the game for the Allies. Never having any storms could make it much easier for them. So I prefer the middle road, which is to have prescribed storms on turns 14, 15, 16. You do make the weather rolls in the other turns, uh, with the exception of turns one and two. To your turn two, it says 50, 50, overcast two, overcast three. The rest of the turns, you go off the table and you simply re-roll on a one. You do not have any storms other than the ones that occur on turns 14, 15, 16. In terms of uh, a balanced and competitive play, I think this is the way to go. We're now in the German player turn for turn one. The first part of the player turn is replacements and there are none on turn one, so we skip that. The next is movement. So what do we do? Well, let's just start. These guys by Cherbourg, this, they have to stay behind this line. They cannot cross until I think the allies get within two. Uh, and they can shift within the perimeter, but they can't leave the perimeter. Exception being these guys with the black box, they're nailed in place until an allied unit gets within two of that specific unit, okay? Uh, the perimeter itself it has defensive advantages, so this is not a bad place to be, but they are not going to be able to assist the folks by Utah Beach. Note that this guy is outside the perimeter, he's free to move. These guys are free to move. They have no black boxes, they, ha they are outside of the perimeter, and these are the main troops that we're going to use to kind of try to try to firm things up and keep things under control at least for the time being we have more options over here we have to figure out how we're going to split up these guys between omaha and utah their job is to be a wedge their job is to not let these two beachheads come together remember one of the victory conditions for the short campaign is to have this road going from Juneau Beach all the way to St. Mary Glees without German zones of control except where allied units are physically sitting. Uh, so let me go ahead and do cogitate here a little bit and see what I can come up with. Down here, there are more, repla uh, there are more uh, units we're getting ready to move. Notice that these are bicycle units. They have that little dot under there. They actually have six movement points when they're trundling along on the road and they stay out of zones of control. And we also have three of these, strategic move counters. 
The Germans can designate units using strat move. They have they can't they can't get into Zox. They can't go next to enemy units and things like that. But uh, it doubles their uh, the strategic movement allowance. So or their, their doubles their movement allowance on the road. So in theory, this guy is a six. With this, he would be a twelve. He can really move using strategic movement. So he's going to be able to get somewhere useful. I think it would be a good time to have our discussion on Zox versus Zox bonds. Okay. Again, I'm not reading you the rule book. I'm not going to do that to you, but there are a few things you need to understand for the rest of what I'm, in, I'm doing to make sense. All right. So we already know that some units have Zox, some do not. This guy with the white circle around his perimeter does not have a Zox. Everybody else you see here does have a Zox. There is no white circle around their units. Uh, Zox are permeable, which means when you walk up to a unit, it has a Zox, forget the terrain, walks up to the unit, it stops. Oops, he's not on camera. Uh, you walk up to a unit, say, bub, 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 you stop, and the next turn you can move. Okay? Uh, you can move one hex, Zox to Zox. That is a permeable Zox system. The Zox, uh, the Zox bonds, however, kind of layer on top of that to make some fundamental changes that really affect both really defensive play, uh, largely, and of course, indirectly offensive play. Uh, since he's got a Zoc and he's got a Zoc, this hex in between is considered to be a Zoc bond hex between those two specific units. And that Zoc bond is not permeable. So when the guy comes up, forget the terrain here, let's say he walks out of the water, comes up to the flooded hex, uh, and he has to stop when he hits the, uh, when he hits the Zoc, that's fine. But the next turn, he does not get to move from here to here because of the Zoc bond. It is, it is rigid. It is inflexible. There's one and only way, one way through a Zoc bond. And that's if there was a third unit here uh, on defense. This guy attacks and wins and kicks him out. He could use an advance to enter or cross a Zoc bond. Okay. Uh, but uh, that is the only, that is the only uh, way you can do that. And let's assume he had an A2 result, so he could actually go here, and then he can go Zach to Zach there or there, forgetting about terrain and all of that. Uh, so Zach's bonds are really the, are the formation of your defense, so the basis of your defense as the German player. Now, what happens when you're a diagonal? So let's say, okay, here, this guy's got a Zach bond with that guy and that hex. These two also have Zach bonds. It's going right down the spine of the hex. So forgetting about this guy, if an allied unit walked up here, he has to stop because of the Zox. He does not get to go from here to here. That is a Zox bond. Only way to cross that is a successful combat in this hex. And so that should tell you that sometimes if you put a German unit here, you're actually weakening your defense because you're opening the possibility of a successful attack across the Zox bond, and then they can cross it. Uh, they can cross it, but supply does not cross it, so you use that judiciously. Uh, the third way to have a Zoc bond is this guy to the coast. So this hex side, because it's going to the coast, there is a Zoc bond, and that's on this uh, hex side running from this unit to the sea. However, it's not true for hexes, so it's not true for the hex here. There is no hex Zoc bond to the sea, but there is a hex side Zoc bond to the sea. Okay, so with that basis, uh, we can go ahead and start planning our defense. Okay, so I moved an infantry unit from here along the road to get him into this, this fortification hex. Now, one of the reasons I, did, I, I want guy, a real guy in there because now it establishes a Zoc. The fortification has no Zoc. None of the string of fortifications has a Zoc, although since they're all bucked up together, it doesn't make as much difference, but still, I want a Zoc. Okay. The second thing I did is I moved an infantry unit from here to here. Why did I do that? Well, I want to put up, I want to get the defense forward, but I also want a hex, a Zoc bond in that hex side. So that means that no matter what happens, pretty much, as long as I don't put a guy here that the allies can successfully hit and then advance through, uh, they can't get through here. No matter what they do, they can't get through. They have to deal with these two, well, at least one of those two units to, to actually advance forward, okay? Uh, and coincidentally, if you look here, we do have a Zoc bond to the sea. So we have that covered as well. And these guys, they're there. They, they are just in the hex that they are. They don't have Zocs of any kind, unless they put a real guy there. I have decided to take advantage of the situation here where we have this allied jumper that's gone down to cadre status. 
for a couple of reasons. One, it, he may be an easy kill. Uh, but second, I have a particular interest in this river. If the Germans can control that river, it is a formidable defense. It, it, they could slow down the Allies for a few turns anyway try, while they try to slog across that river. It's got flooded hexides, which adds to the defense uh, substantially. Uh, flooded hexides, if you are only attacking across flooded hexide, the attacker is halved on a unit by unit basis. All halving is done on a unit by unit basis, rounded up on a unit by unit basis. But so all the attackers would be halved, as I've described, plus an additional shift to the left. It's hard getting across a flooded river with swamps around it and stuff like that. So if the Germans can kick the Allied units, kick these trooper, paratroopers out of uh, this area, uh, get them east of the river, they've set themselves up to have a, a pretty tough defense while they try to hold off the building Allied strength. All right, so what did I do? Well, I've got these guys. So I've got a couple infantry units and an armored unit. And I want to point out that one of the first steps of the combat sequence is to designate a main attack force, or MAF. The MAF has to be all from the same formation, and so these little emblems in the corner, the unit symbols, they're not just for eye candy. They let you know who can team up in an attack and be called part of the same main attack force. So you can see all these units match up nicely, uh, and so they will all get the benefits of being in the MAF. In addition, uh, one additional unit can be designated that's stacked with uh, a MAF unit, and it will also be part of the MAF. The difference is units in the MAF have had attack at full strength. Anyone not in the MAF attacks at half strength, have done a unit by unit basis, rounded up. Okay, so we have, let's count factors. We have, since everybody's in the MAF, he's the extra unit that's going to be declared as part of the MAF. All these other guys have their emblems matching. So he's four, six, eight. Now he's attacking across this river, so he's going to be half. So there are 10 attack factors here. Uh, there's no shift to the left because we have units that are not attacking across the flooded hex sites. Uh, so the, that negates the shift to the left. So we have four, six, eight, 10 factors on the attack. We have on the defense, we have a uh, take my uh, t take it for granted. It's a two point ca uh, cadre under there. Troop quality zero. The two points uh, uh, units do get a benefit for a defensive bonus. In this case, it's generally done via extra extra uh, combat factors on the defense. You can have it's based on the terrain of the hex and the size of the unit. Uh, the terrain of the hex. So this is a bocage hex. And in a Bocage Hex, you can have up to three points added, DCB, a Defensive Combat Bonus. But the DCP cannot exceed the base strength of the unit. That's a two-strength unit. Even though the terrain would give three, he can only get two. So he's worth four. So we have 10 attack points, and, and we have four defense points. So that sounds like a two-to-one, but not quite. Uh, there are two other things that we have to take into account. One is armor strength. And if you look, we have a tank. Now, the gray symbol, that two in the middle of the bottom, is the uh, armor factor. Bigger the better. Two is kind of meh, but the other guy has nothing. Okay, So anything's good against nothing. Uh, any kind of uh, armor with the gray box, as opposed to the red box, which I'll mention in a little bit, the gray box is armor. That will, that will give a, always give a shift on a defender that has no armor capability at all. Uh, second, troop quality. All right, so to get a troop quality bonus uh, on the attack, you have to have a higher troop quality. Your best has to be better than their best. Take, my, uh, take it for granted that's a zero underneath there, and our best is a zero on the attack. So there's going to be no benefit on the uh, troop quality. Note, important note. This is not a symmetrical rule. I can't tell you how many games I played when I first started this system that I got that wrong. So, for example, if the defender's a plus one, like you see that paratrooper just to the southeast of this hex, he's a plus one, and we have zeros coming in, there is not a shift on the defense. Only the attacker gets a troop quality 
shift under normal circumstances. The defender does not get a true quality shift. Exception, if all of the attackers are, uh, are, are basically less than zero, so it'd be minus one or minus two troop quality, and the defender is better than, the, than, than their best, the attacker loses a shift. So the defender will gain a shift if it's absolutely cruddy troops like this, like this Ost battalion hanging out here. These, oops, sorry. These Russians don't feel like fighting today or wherever they came from. And they're minus two, so they are inclined not to fight very hard. If they were to be on an attack and there was nothing better, it would give the defenders an additional shift. All right, so we have 10 to 4 with one shift for armor. But wait, but wait, just like in the infomercials, there's more. I have a headquarters back here. When you move a headquarters no more than one hex, it is eligible to use artillery to support if it's within five. One, two, three, four, five. We're in five. To do that, we have to pay an ammo point. So let's pay it out of the uh, seventh army total. And that will give us another shift. The Germans get to do up to one from a standard headquarters and one from a naval warfare headquarters. Uh, we'll get, I don't think we'll get there. I don't think we'll have naval warfare in the seven turn scenario. But there's a way to get two shifts. Let's, let's leave it at that. Uh, but it's gonna be a shift, another shift. So we had a base two to one. And we had it in two shifts, one for armor, one for artillery. And so I'm going to mark that as a four for one. And you'll see I use these little dice to mark odds so that I'd spend all this time calculating it. And then when after the movement's done uh, and it's time to do it, I don't have to go back and recalculate everything. Isn't that cool? All right. Next, let me see what we're going to do over by Utah. So continuing the, uh, the German move. Uh, I got a guy up to here, and one of the reasons I put him here is because I expect to win this attack, and I want to do the advance into this hex. When you uh, advance after combat, you are not required to advance into the hex where the enemy was, where he retreated out of or was eliminated from. Uh, unlike most games, you can, uh, you can advance in any direction you want to. So, since the first hex of advance does not have to be the vacated hex, I want to go here because that'll form a Zakban from here to here and here to here. So the plan is to start hemming them in, all right? Uh, I decided not to withdraw from, from this point. I want to hem them in. I want to make it tough. I don't want to give up ground easy. Put a guy here, creates a Zakban. Farther down, I had forgotten to do the point to hawk attack, so I did it, and it, it was a, a trade. We eliminated one ranger. We eliminated the defending coastal defense. Uh, the second, the, there, excuse me, the fifth ranger battalion, 50-50 whether he's going to show up here or show up with Omaha Beach's follow-up wave. It showed up here, so it took the hex. Uh, Oh, follow, uh, over by the uh, Omaha Beach, uh, the strategy is to hem them in. So, you can see I put crappy little units here, but crappy, these crappy little units have zocks. They form a zock bond between these two hexes and a zock bond to the coast. So, Omaha Beach is fully hemmed in. It will not be able to bring in the second wave reinforcements. They will be able to kick these guys out of there. They're, they're plenty strong for that. But So this is a delaying tactic. We're not going to push them back into the sea with this. But again, the, long, the more we can delay, uh, the better chance the German has of uh, winning the, the scenario and, uh, and the campaign in the long run. Okay. Uh, here you see this is a headquarters. It moved more than one hex, so it flipped. And if you recall, I used the headquarters over here. He only moved one hex, so he did not flip, and he was eligible to shoot. Uh, let's see. Continuing on, I am trying to hem him in. This is a Zakban to the sea. This is not a real hex. And we have Zakban, Zakban. Uh, this is not a Zakban, but it is a Zak. There's no sound of control in this hex, so that cannot be a Zak bond. I, I think a Zak's good enough. They'll move one hex and be done. Okay, so we're just slowing them down, hemming them in. Uh, we moved, uh, we, we used, did some strategic move, gave us double move. Uh, we were staging another attack over here. This is only a two-point unit, so we decided to go for it. And there's a rule. If you're within three hexes of Kahn, you, uh, you, that counts as a headquarters. 
So we were able to use an artillery point. And let's go ahead and add it up so that we see how we did that again. All right, so these guys, I forget, oh, that's the 21st Panzer Division. Okay, there you are, the main attack force. So we have six, nine, 12, and then this guy's going to be halved because he's not stacked with a main attack force unit, so he can't be the free bonus unit. So, so it's 13, two, he is in mixed terrain, which gives an up to two points, uh, two points of uh, benefit on the defense, and that does not exceed the strength of units, so both, uh, all the points count. So it's four on defense, and what did I say, 11 on the, on the attack, six, nine, oh, 12, 13 on the attack. So it's 13 to four. That would be, that would be three to one. But we have armor here, and that is, again, it's a gray box, so it's a tank. Tank destroyers don't count. It has to be a tank. All right, so that's a shift. And we do not have an infantry or superiority. He is a plus one unit. Plus one is as good as it gets. But it does not, it only negates the shift. It does not give a shift, okay? But, and I threw an artillery point from Khan, so I paid another point out of our stash of artillery points. So we have three to one plus two, five. All right, that's, uh, that's kind of the move. It says up here, we just, he was within two, so we moved him. These guys are frozen in place. They can't do anything. So we have two attacks to stage for the German part of the turn. We have a four to one. Uh, let's take a look at what this does. Five, D1. Okay, D1. That's a good roll. Uh, defender takes a hit. He's already a cadre. He's gone. And because this is a combat loss, we do not increase the stash of replacement points for this para unit. Now, something special happens. Oop, it's, <laughs> my, my, the framework is over this. This is going to stack. This is going to stack on top of the unit that was lost. And now this cadre it cannot be used again until we start putting replacements into this unit, which we do have enough to rebuild that unit. Uh, st uh, cadres that are removed in this way in the main campaign can cost you the game. That's part of the victory conditions. We don't need to deal with that here, but that just suffice to say that cadre cannot be used again until we free him up by starting to pump replacements into this unit that was taken off the board. Okay, now we've got a five to one. Oh boy, let's see what we do here. Oh, let's see, five to one, oh, and I had an advance. Yes, I'm sure I had an advance, and I told, as I said, uh, we're gonna advance here. One hex, and we're gonna create these Zoc bonds that we wanna create to hem in the allies. We now have only one unit on the side of the river that we want to control. So possible we'll kick him out, although he will be much tougher than this guy. Okay. One word about uh, when you add up attack factors and defense factors for that matter. There's a special rule in this scenario or in this game that you cannot have more than 18 points on the attack or the defense no matter what, okay? Never seen that rule before. But basically, if the defender if the defender puts 10 points in a hex, including the defensive bonuses for the hex, he is two to one proof on the basic odds. Now the odds can get pumped as we've seen through artillery, through troop quality, through tanks, through various means. But the base odds will never be better than one to one if you have 10 points on the defense because the attacker, no matter how many points he puts on the attack, only gets 18. Okay, same is true for the defender. No more than 18 points in the defense. He, he just hits that limit a whole lot less than the attacker. Uh, talk about stacking for a second. Four points is the limit. Uh, four points, four stacking points. A one or two strength point unit counts as one. Uh, anything more than two, so three or more counts as two. Uh, and you get one silhouette unit for free. So Yes, that's for example, that's a silhouette unit. So the first one you put in a hex is free. After that, they count like anything else. So if you have a whole stack of, uh, of silhouette units, the limits still apply. All right, so we've counted out. We've done the shift. We've pumped in the artillery. We did the tanks. Uh, we got a five to one over here. Oh, one other thing. Certain terrains will, will not allow the tank 
shit, the, the take benefit. Uh, so th- particularly tough terrain, cities, things like that will not allow it. Uh, Bocage is, or excuse me, mix is not one of those things. Bocage isn't either. So uh, we do get the tank shift. It is a five to one. Roll a one. Five to one is defender retreat. Okay, well, he got off lucky. Uh, now, let's talk about that. Uh, we do not have a Zoc bond that we're attempting to cross. We do, we, we do have a Zoc which, uh, which is not going to affect us off, uh, in the first hex of retreat. And let's see. DT, oh, defender retreat. Retreat, that is a two retreat. However, terrain and friendly units, certain types of terrain and friendly units can stop a retreat at one hex. I'm pretty sure those woods will be included in that. In fact, I know they will be. So he's just going to fall back into the woods. He's going to give up that drop zone. And if I remember right, the drop zones are victory points in this scenario. So that's not necessarily a good thing. But hey, he could have died. So, so that's that. And we can do an advance if we care to. I... Okay. Remember, you don't have to advance in the vacated hex. So I think teaming this guy up with that guy, and now all of a sudden what was weak now looks strong, and we have Zoc Bonds all through. So you see, I keep going back to Zoc Bonds. Zoc Bonds is how you build your defense. All right, that will conclude the German half of the turn. Then we go on to the Allied half of the turn. Remember, they actually kind of get two turns in the, uh, the first turn of the game, the invasion, and then their standard half of the turn. And so we're going we're gonna to deal with that. We've got invasions that are bottled up. We've got to kick the door open here and, and try to get more guys on the continent so that we can kick the Nazis back to Germany. All right, let me see what the Allies can do. As we begin the Allied turn, let's touch on what it means to be scattered. Uh, we have a number of scattered airborne units out there. Let's, let's find out what that means. Uh, for number one, they may not move or attack. So uh, they're basically going to be sitting there. They do defend normally, however. Uh, they may not receive replacements, so we can't start building the guys that got damaged back up. Uh, and we may not build improved positions with them, which... For now, especially for the allies, it may not be as such an important thing. Uh, and they cannot form a Zoc bond, although they do have a Zoc. So, what difference does that make? Well, actually, uh, this guy could have moved out in his turn because this airborne unit and that airborne unit may not form a Zoc bond. So he could say I've moved here. But I don't mind him being a speed bump. I, I have no problem with him staying right there just to kind of limit the allies' move. We don't want them to be trundling all over the place. Let's make them attack him. The allied player turn would normally begin with things like uh, taking replacements, but on turn one, there are no replacements. So let's go ahead and dive straight into the movement. Here are the second wave reinforcements for the uh, Utah Beach area. So let's just touch on what this is. Uh, we have two units. We have a actually a jumper that didn't jump. He's coming in on the beach. We have uh, part of the infantry, 4th uh, Division. I believe that would be the 4th Infantry Division. We already have brought in two of the three units. Here's the third. And we have some tanks. And since this is not the invasion turn, we're done with the Donald Duck rule. There will be no rolling to see if we lose any further steps. Uh, in addition, we have a core headquarters. This is the, this is the unit from which artillery uh, 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 emanates from. It has a five hex range as long as it hasn't moved or no, or hasn't moved uh, more than one hex. Uh, we saw that with the German attack in the earlier part of the turn. And this is the engineer unit. It never moves. It basically says, this is an active beachhead. So long as I'm sitting here, this is an active beachhead. And that is one of the victory conditions for this scenario is having all your, all your uh, beachheads being active. All right. So, and we can count up stacking points. Basically, that's, we have four and a hex. That's two, two, one, or two, two. And then the silhouetted unit is free. Uh, the core headquarters is free and the engineer unit is free. So we have our, even with all these guys coming in the same hex, they still are in compliance with stacking rules. So 
I'm going to go ahead and bring them in. Now, there's there's three types of movement in this game. Okay, we, uh, we already saw some strategic movement, like this guy here. He, uh, he moved double as a movement allowance. As long as he didn't start next to anybody, didn't go through any zocks, didn't end up next, he can really motor, okay? Uh, that's uh, movement uh, mode one. The other's normal movement, using movement points, using uh, 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 all the normal uh, terrain effects rules, and so forth. The third type of, of uh, movement is tactical movement. And basically, you go zero or one hex, okay? You, has, you still can't go walking through zock bonds, uh, but, uh, but you can basically ignore terrain you can go or excuse me you can go one or two hexes one or two hexes uh and uh, when when guys land on the beach the only move they can do is tactical movement and if we're going to be consistent with the invasion uh that was the first move is going to be onto the beach and then they'll get one more hex okay uh they can at and uh, when units hit the beach uh, as reinforcements, they if they attack anyone, it's at half value no matter what. And uh, no unit has ever halved more than once in any one combat. So if you're attacking across the river, if you're not part of the MAF, the, the main attack force, and you are new reinforcements, all three of those would half you. You still only are halved one time. All right, let's go ahead and, and see what we're going to do at Utah. So, we entered the, uh, the units uh, for, uh, as the second wave. We just let, put them on the beach, and immediately they attack this strong point that doesn't have any further support. Uh, the attacker, because they just came in as reinforcements, they're halved on the attack. Remember, it's done each unit separately, rounded up. Uh, and when you add it up, it's enough for a 3 to 1. Uh, the defender... Is only a two-point unit. Strong points when they when there's no other units in the hex, they do not uh, they do not get any of the train benefits, so they don't get any extra points. If it was an infantry unit, they would. It's a two-point unit. It would get two extra points from the terrain that it's sitting in. I believe it's mixed, uh, but because this isn't a strong point without any further help, they don't get that. So it's just two, two points. Uh, they have enough, even though they're half, to get a three to one. And they still get the armor shift, or excuse me, they get the troop quality shift, but not the armor shift. You don't get armor against any, uh, every single type of terrain, or in this case, every single type of unit. Strong points do negate the, uh, the armor shift, okay? But it does not negate the troop quality shift, and the allies have the advantage. They have higher troop quality than the strong point. So that's going to be uh, one shift up from three to one, plus the naval units are used on turn one, but not the Air Force. So we're going to put one of our naval bombardment units on there to bring it up to a happy five to one. And one of the nice things about five to one versus four to one is the exchange result goes away. And so we wanted to we wanted to try to do something with that, especially you'll see on Omaha Beach that's something that it might, a little bit more of a consideration than in here. But uh, we decided to use the boats here and and just. Get it up to five to one so we didn't worry about it all right over here we have the fourth infantry division there's a six point unit under this guy there's another one over here uh we're putting the tank in the main attack force we want his benefits uh the 101st airborne is in support but is have because it's not part of the main attack force on uh, defense so this lousy two-point unit actually does, with even minus two troop quality, does get the extra two points from the terrain. So it's defending at four. Uh, they, there's enough attack factors to get a three to one. We're taking a shift up because we're bringing in that armor as part of the main attack force, and we're bringing in, uh, well, we, and we have uh, greater troop quality. He's a minus two after all. Uh, one of the reasons we're not using, we don't want to use the 101st because we don't want them to be forced to take losses. Remember, there are no replacements other than the scatter losses uh, the, from the initial drop. By not taking them as part of the main attack force, they are less likely to be able to take hits. It's going to go on the main attack force units. Okay, so we got two five to ones. Panning over to Omaha Beach. Well, uh... The odds, the, the way we're calculating the odds on this attack is that we have two four-point units. Remember, both took hits on the uh, beach assault against 
a two point unit, but it gets two extra points from the terrain it's defending in. So it's a four points on defense. So, and with the three point tank that does not bring it up any further in odds. So that is going to be a, a two to one base attack. Uh, it's going to be 11 to four. We do not get a bonus for two troop quality because they're all zeros all around. So this is a better guy than the guy we saw over that we saw over that way. Uh, so, but we do get, we have tanks and they don't have tanks. That's a shift. And we are giving armor support. So that is going to be four to one. Over on the other side, we have two units from uh, the first infantry division, one depleted, one not. That's 11 attack points. And we have the armor added as the unit, the extra unit to the MAF. You get to bring in one extra that's stacked with the MAF, main attack force, which of course is the first infantry. That's, so that's, um, that's 14 points. On defense, two, plus two points, plus two points from the terrain, so it makes it a four. Okay, so it's 14 to four, three to one. Uh, we get a benefit. We got tanks and they don't. That's one shift. That's four to one. And our infantry is zero po uh, troop quality and the defender is minus one. So that is a nice handy five to one. And on the Commonwealth side of the world, uh, we have from the Gold Beach, these guys moved over from here to here, are attacking this unit that was really intended just to be a, a, a short-term blocker. And I expect him to be a short-term guy here. Uh, it was a two to one base with armor and troop quality shifts. All right, over here we have a two to one plus a tank bonus and the uh, and the naval bombardment bringing this up to four to one. Note that uh, some of these units are halved because they were, one of them was a reinforcement. The rest of them are all halved because they're attacking over that river. Although that does not negate the, uh, the using the armor bonus, which we wanted to get the shift. So uh, going across a minor uh, river does not negate the shift. Uh, we have a stack here attacking a very weak unit, managing a two to one plus troop quality and uh, an armor bonus brings it to four to one. Uh, here we're managing a two to one, but we put the naval bombardment and we get the troop quality. So that's four to one. And over here between the guys that were already there and the guys that are landing, remember the guys landing are attacking at half, but they can't attack. It's a blistering uh, seven plus to one. Uh, it's only a two point unit uh, and he does not He's not able to bring in the uh, any kind of bonuses for terrain because he does not have anybody with them. He's only a strong point. They're they're small and they were not able to. They they weren't that strong. So anyway, we have a blistering seven to one maximum attack on that guy. All right, I'm going to uh, resolve the combats. And here we have the broad brush view, and basically you can see attacks are happening up and down the uh, the entire line. Uh, both uh, on, on, on every beach. We need to be developing uh, some breathing room. Omaha is so tight right now that they can't even bring any units above zero stacking, which is a bad thing. Uh, and so we got to brush all these uh, delaying units back before the real defenders show up. All right, let me go ahead and start, and start doing some die rolls. We have a five to one. So let's see what we got. Two, which is not a good roll, but it is a defender retreat. Uh, let's see, defender retreat on this strong point. All right. Well, now we can do is to talk about determined defense. There's a there. Once you have, if you have a retreat result and you don't want to retreat because that would kill this guy, uh, we get to roll on the determined defense table, and this is. This is mixed terrain, so it would be considered other. And in other, only a five or six do anything. Uh, if there was a headquarters in range, we could pump in extra, uh, pump in a point for artillery. Uh, that would give it a plus one. Uh, the defender names a lead unit, and this is where troop quality can help. And also this is where your, uh, uh, your anti-tank weapons can help. Uh, and any tank weapon that's good enough can also, also 
provide uh, an advantage for uh, combat on the determined defense table. But we have none of that here. We just have a crappy unit that's trying to save its own skin. And, well, let's see. A five result will cost him a step, and a six result would be an exchange. So he could get a pound of flesh if he's lucky, but he's gone. All right, determined defense. He rolled a five. Well, he would have stayed if he, he that would have negated the retreat result had, uh, uh, if he had more steps than one, but it's just going to take one step loss and die, and the attackers get to advance in. So this guy's gone. One step unit goes away. And as you can see, the 4th Infantry unit advanced into the vacated hex. The airborne proceeded to move, go this way to, uh, to jump on another airborne unit who is currently uh, scattered. All right, we have a, we have a five to one. Six. Uh, we got lucky. We rolled a six. And let's see, A1, D2. So A1, D2. A1, actually, in this case, the rolling a six wasn't quite as lucky as rolling a five or, uh, four or five because the attacker will take a loss to the main attack force. And the defender will take two steps. Well, I guess, uh, but he was a one-step unit to begin with, right? Right. So actually, a four, four or five would have been a better roll than a six. Ha <laughs> ha! Good for them. All right, we got to take a step loss here, and then we do get advancing options. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're going to be able to go up two hexes, and let's see what we can do with it. And here we're going to uh, uh, advance the armor unit alone. Here, here to buck up the scattered infantry that is also taking a step loss. We don't want to get him, if, if the Germans can hit him with tanks, it could be a bad day. So now we've, we've taken care of that problem. We will go ahead and risk an armored shift here, uh, but we're much stronger there, so we can afford to. All right, that is the American zone. Or excuse me, that's Utah Beach. Now let's go to Omaha. Uh, we have a pair of four to ones here. Let's do the first one to the left. Six. D1. Okay, so in this case, rolling a six is a good thing. Okay. D1 eliminates the German unit that only had one step to begin with, and now we get to advance. Uh, so I'm going to do that. And in this case, I'm only going to take one step forward because both units are already hit, and uh, we don't want to stick our nose out quite so far, but we do want to get off that beach. All right, second one. All right, we rolled a six on the five to one table, uh, A1, D2. And so the attacker is gonna take a hit. So we flip over one of the, un, uh, we, hit, we flip over the unhurt infantry unit, D2. Well, again, this is, he's only got one step, so it was kind of a waste. A four or five would have been a better roll, is what it is. All right, then I'm gonna do the advances. And this is very tentative advance. I just moved over to here. Now, I, again, now we've got all these units are taking a step loss. All the infantry at Omaha Beach is one step down, so that's four of them. Uh, and I, would, I just don't want to stick my nose out quite so far. We do have, uh, we want to protect this beachhead. We have a Zakbond here. We have Zakbonds here. So it is nicely cordoned off, and the goal, again, is to, so that we can bring in our full reinforcements next turn to keep building this up, because that is the absolute vital thing. These beachheads have to be able to bring in new units. All right, to the Commonwealth. We've got a four to one on the left, going left to right, four to one. A five, four to one, five is a D1. That is a good roll. It simply applies a casualty to this guy who is only one step, and he goes away. And we do get a two hex advance. All right, we've elected to uh, take this advance. Uh, we do have a Zakban to the ocean, so, uh, we have, so we don't have to worry about anyone motoring on through. I expect to take this hex, then we'll have Zakbans going that way. All right, we have the next four to one. Four. Very good rolling. A1, D1, take one hit. Both sides take a hit. Defenders uh, a retreat. And we have to move one, one group across the river. 
so we no longer have to contend with that and these guys are going to stay here just to keep the sock pond to the ocean make sure we don't have any uh funny business going to be happening and we also have a sock pond to this guy okay four to one next four to one six Ooh, smoking d1 result clear and simple this guy goes away we get to advance two allies get to advance two and the allies have established firm control of this beach zone and we're firmly across the river that was giving us trouble which is good because once real stuff gets there it wouldn't get any easier all right we got a four to one on the coastal defense <laughs> 61 goes away go away Mr. Fortress Europa, go away. This guy has no Zock. All right, this guy has no Zock. He had, there's no real units in there. It's cordoned off and isolated, so I'm not going to worry about that guy. Uh, we advance two to uh, push this forward even more. And finally, we have a big honking seven to one. Well, we saved the, the two for this one, which also turns into a D1 given the high odds. So this guy goes away. We advance two. And you know, we, needed to, we needed to start clearing this out because these airborne guys are getting in some trouble. We want to be able to reinforce them uh, with some regular ground units. We need, we need some armor over there to help out. We've got the 21st pans are pressing on these guys and they are going to need help before long and we're going to provide it. We just cleared out the hex. We're going to do an advance too. And uh, actually because they were reinforcing this turn come, uh, just having come off the beach, they have a limited advance. They only get to go one just because of being reinforcements. They're going to go over here just to make more, more happy room to bring in more happy guys across the beach. And uh, we are not in a bad position, I think, to start helping the airborne. Uh, if not turn two, then I think turn three, I think we ought to be able to do that. All right. That is the allied player turn. Uh, there's a cleanup phase where I take pick up all these markers that are all over the place, uh, the, the scatters and the reinforcements and so forth. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So here's the situation at the end of turn one. As the Allies have recovered all these um, uh, scattered markers and so forth, so that's no longer an issue. We have a decent landing at Utah Beach. We, have, we, we retain the bridgehead across the river that we're trying to keep. We've done some reinforcing here to keep these other airborne units that are damaged. Uh, give, keep them, make them more resistant to armor attacks. Uh, so things are, right now, seem pretty stable on the Utah Beach area. Uh, we have only one battalion at Ponte Hawk that is going to be reinforced shortly, I'm sure. Uh, on Omaha Beach, uh, we had a rough start. We don't have a lot of strength. We have a whole bunch of understrength units. But on the good news side, there's not a whole lot here that's going to bother us. Uh, the reinforcements, I mean, this guy, it's one of the bicycle guys. Uh, they're low quality. They're just going to be delaying units again, but we're not going to be able to stop the flow of reinforcements coming in over Omaha Beach as the German. They are going to be coming unless something really good and unexpected happens in the German player move of turn two. Uh, good progress over here. Some good die rolls for the Commonwealth. Uh, and so that they've gotten across the, uh, the river. They've gotten across the river. They're about to link up with the Americans. Uh, one note is that this hex for you see the, the, the American and British flags, that is a boundary which the units cannot cross except for one going one hex beyond. They can move or, and or attack one hex beyond that boundary. That's it. So British the Commonwealth stays on that side. And Americans stay on that side. And that's it. Okay. So the Americans have gone about as far east as they can go. Uh, the British are, are going to be coming quickly. We have to eliminate this guy. Clear out Bayou, which is a, an objective for this scenario. And uh, begin to really clear out this road, which is another objective. Again, the real fight for that road, I expect to be over here. 
Okay. Uh, the Brits have made good progress in the uh, in the uh, Juno and Sword beaches. There are still some strong points to take out, but you can't kill everything in one move, so we'll get to that soon enough. Uh, the British para unit, it's taken, uh, it's taken a hit. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting squeezed. We don't have armor support yet. They are going to need help if this, if this 21st Panzer sticks around. Uh, eventually it's going to be really hard on them, so they're going to need help real soon, and I expect it to come. Now that we're done with turn one, I think I'll go ahead and uh, stop here and post this up on YouTube for you guys to see and follow on with additional turns as I work through this. Uh, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and, and hit the subscribe button so that you can get notified and follow the other things that I have in mind going down the road. Take care and have yourself a great day.